Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Cat collab for Encyclia Garciana. Mine is the Alba form, and that is how I bought her. She is now called Prostechia Garciana, in my case, Alba. In this care collab, I have teamed up with What's Up Orchids. She also has an Encyclia Garciana, and I do believe hers is the true form, the beautiful saturated colors in the bloom that I wanted. But I got the Alba instead. She was a bit mislabeled. Never mind, this orchid has given me nothing but <laughs> the feeling that I can grow orchids very, very well. She is vigorous and she seems to be loving the conditions I have here in southern Spain. So let's get into temperatures because in her altitude preference, she's at around 1,200 meters where she is found in cloud forests in Venezuela. Now there's some discussion about who discovered her first or whatever. There's a bit of conflicting information on the internet, whether it was 1986 or whether she was found in 61. Either way, I consider her a relatively new discovered species and think goodness that they did find her because honestly if you've got temperatures that you can maintain between 15 degrees celsius up to approximately 30 degrees that would be her maximum but huh, here in southern spain she can tolerate 40 plus degrees with plenty of airflow so if you have that and you can do that indoors and you can provide her with plenty of water this orchid very very quickly goes from a two or three bulb division as i got her in 2018 just three bulbs <laughs> uh, you see what's going on here now this is 2021 she is super super vigorous so they consider her a cool to warm grower well cool 15 degrees celsius yeah not so much in my books i'm a little bit more of a pansy by that time i start feeling like it's getting cold but that is her baseline let's say i leave her outdoors in my climate until the temperatures are around 13 degrees celsius i push it a little bit more when she was on a mount she was out for longer but then of course i had more control of how wet i kept the roots this year in 2021 i switched her from a mount to this bowl that you see here, which is a semi-hydro setup. There is no inner pot because I could not keep up with the watering. Let's go in a little bit. Let me show you what I mean. The symptoms of not being able to keep up with the watering because the leaves do nasty things like this. This is still remnants of when the orchid was not in her prime, prime watering setup. And even though the water then comes afterwards and is abundant, the leaves will never straighten out. And I have several little examples in there, including some growths that are new growths, but the roots haven't quite reached the water source just yet. And you can see that down here, I hope, there. If these growths don't grow clean, they will squeeze out the buds. The buds cannot come through if the leaf can't open properly, you see? Here we have a leaf that's at least just at the tip and then it grew out clean. But the sheath in there, if this was all scrunched up as I used to have in the past, then the buds can't form. They don't have the strength to push out and they pretty much just deteriorate within the closed leaf. So the idea about this orchid is water a lot of water especially where i'm at that is why after three years of having her on a mount um i just couldn't keep up there was too much growing as far as new growth by the apex of the orchid of the mount i had to spray so many times a day i was thinking i was going to risk my new growths and who wants that so i took her off the mount and it would have been a relatively easy job she was super super rooted onto that wood plaque that I had planned for her for a long time. Turns out she's more vigorous than that plaque was. So she's really well rooted on it. <laughs> um, I just didn't remember to remove the wire. So I was struggling more than I needed to, to get her off the mount. The roots are pretty cool. They're, you know, they're long and they can branch a little bit, but they are so, so vigorous. She is just abundant in every sense of the word. Like I said, if you get a three bulb division, first of all, she's gonna bloom on the next new growth. So that would mean with four bulbs, you've already got blooms coming. There's always about two blooms per spike, sometimes three. The more blooms that come out on a spike, the more crowded it gets because they don't grow very long. You can see all the blooms are somewhat tucked in between the leaves. 
so they don't actually grow long and out and away from the leaf apex. So two blooms is pretty okay. If you get three, then well, just understand that these blooms will be a little bit crowded. It is not because you're not doing something right. That's just the way the orchid grows. But water is one of the main factors that I can emphasize with regards to this orchid. So mine went into a 30 centimeter <laughs> diameter bowl. So you can see from the previous habit how she was on a mount. There's a lot of lush growth to the right of the orchid there, lots of it, because if she was on a mount, she'd be upright and all this was on the back side. So I put her into the setup here and there's more room down here simply because I'm trying to train the orchid to grow upright and fill the bowl upright as best as possible and as best as the growths will grow out. But I have her in a crocked layer of lava rock, the Akadama, which is on top. Akadama is highly, highly water retentive, creates a great environment around the orchid, the leaves as such, because if, for example, not all the roots are managing to get into the media quickly, then also new growths that are a little bit more suspended, as you can see up here, with roots growing into the pot right there. You see, these roots would fail if there wasn't enough humidity around. So the Akadama for me provides a wonderful climate around this orchid to give it the humidity around the leaves and also to uphold the water that I pour into this orchid every second or third day, depending on how hot it is. During the summer, of course, every third day is a must. This media must never dry out, not because of the makeup of the media, but because of the orchid's needs. It must never dry out. And now in the winter, it's just a question of maintaining the surface of the media damp because it is so, so highly wicking that I don't have to be misting around here anymore. A jug of water goes in, be it plain RO water or fertilized water, which I would do at 300 parts per million full on. <laughs> the orchid kind of says, give me more, but 300 parts per million. And that would be at every watering, even this time of year, fall, winter, because these growths are just now fattening up their bulbs. And I want them to be nice and chubby so that they can provide me with lots and lots of blooms. So you see, I still have space here. I have my light coming from where we are stood. So this is facing the light, not necessarily direct sunlight, but facing the light. So I remember I want the back of the orchid to start to grow towards and into the pot. And it looks like throughout the summer, I've been working on that using my very, very highly reflective facade, which is white, to be my source of light while she is in shade. Because even though she could handle full sun, my sun can get a little bit too much. Because again, Southern Spain, and I have very, very little humidity and an average throughout the year. And that is why she is always in shade, but the light source is so intense and you see bit by bit, I'm getting the growth to respond and go up. It looks like she's not centered in the pot, but once again, that is how she was positioned on a mound. And it looks like she's more crowded in the back here, but that was just because of how she was positioned on the mound. There's the same amount of space <laughs> distance between this side and the other side. So this side always faces towards the hedge and it is this side in the, what I consider the front here now that I'm encouraging to get really, really nice and upright so that the orchid can stay in this pot for another maybe three years, that would be nice. Because this being so vigorous, she is going to triple in size, much like a Maxillaria variabilis, every single year. I cannot count the amount of growths I have in this pot. I tried. Uh, there's too many and I'm not going to start going one, two, three, no. She's going to fill this pot by 2023, 20, no problem at all. I thought about dividing her at the beginning of spring, but first of all, what I'm trying to do is make sure that the growths grow into the pot straight because that'll make a division much, much easier. Let me see if I can position her in such a way that you can see the blooms which I will be interchanging with other footage because when she is in the sun, the blooms sparkle like, like they've been dusted with mica. 
So you can see how the blooms are just beautifully positioned in that apex. It is fundamental to keep this orchid watered for those blooms to be able to even come through. They are relatively sturdy and tough little blooms to the touch, but still they don't have the strength to go through that sheath and that leaf if the leaf isn't fully open. The bloom looks like it's upside down, so it's quite tough to be able to see the beautiful lip inside. But I managed to get in there with the camera so that you could see what it looks like with the lip down a little bit. And you can look into the column and you can see the light, light markings of the green that finds itself right at the end. So it's not just lavender spotting on this orchid. There's also some interest behind the lip, which is not easily identified when looking at the blooms from the top. Oh, but the fragrance. The fragrance is much more intense if she is exposed to sunshine. Let me pull that back as well. Exposed to bright light. So the brighter the light, and if you can, some afternoon sun, It'll fill a room with a beautiful talcum powder fragrance. That's how I can describe it. It is powdery, it is not overbearingly sweet. It's a perfume, but not in the sense of a vaporizer perfume. It is very powdery, and I always describe it as if it is one of those really, really fancy talcum powders that you get at specialty boutiques. The ones where you say, well, I don't use talcum powder, but when you smell it, you're kind of tempted to buy it that kind of talcum powder. It's very, very elegant. And if you were growing this orchid indoors, it would definitely, definitely fill your room if she were up against some good light. And this fragrance, it lasts throughout the entire day. By late afternoon, it'll diminish a little bit and then it'll pick up again the next day. And these blooms are super long lasting. Each individual bloom lasts about six to eight weeks. And this orchid just keeps blooming every once in a while. Another bloom opens, another sheath opens. So as blooms fade, you can see they look a little bit more lavender, like a solid lavender, but this is a bloom that is fading. As this bloom fades, the next bud opens. As these two are already open, the next bud will open as one of them fades. So six to eight weeks per bloom, consider that quite a long period of a bloom spectacle because more buds will always follow and you've got an orchid blooming for about three months. Now, if you look this orchid up on the internet to get descriptions and care, etc., they would classify her as a miniature. And yeah, to a degree that is true. She is a miniature-ish, kind of. <laughs> Um, she's not high. She's not a tall orchid per se. She just grows so fast that I wouldn't call this 30 centimeter bowl a uh, miniature orchid. Um, her space requirements are pretty easy to accommodate. With a bit of light training, you know, her growth will be upright. So she's not a space hog in a sense that she needs to have a lot of space around her left or right. She is an upright grower. It's just, I don't consider this orchid to be miniature at all. So size-wise, if you see that on the internet, if you're looking her up and want to get one, know that if they say miniature, well, yes. But be prepared for the vigor of a prostechia that makes these orchids such fun to grow. Like I said in the beginning, this orchid, I love it. It makes me feel like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> And we need orchids like that in our collection. The fussy ones, well, they will always be there. But sometimes it's an orchid like this has a gorgeous fragrance. It's got long lasting blooms. It is vigorous and it really, really rewards you with lots of new growths, lots of blooms. It's a good feel factor orchid to have. I'm enjoying it. Uh, what am I going to do when I bring it inside in the winter? Well, I have a lower shelf for her winter stint, which is right by a terrace door, which I usually do have open because our temperatures are so mild. But my indoor temperatures in winter will be a 15 degrees Celsius. And if it is a little bit lower, that's not a problem. But there she will get direct winter sunshine because of the angle of the sun at that time of year. In the summer, she lives either in my blooming alley on a lower shelf throughout the months of June through September because I don't want any of that hot direct sun on her. And then when the angle of the sun is already a little bit lower at the end of September, 
heading early October, she goes and lives out where the Angraecums are because they like a lot of bright light as well, but they don't want any direct sun. So she is in my deep south space. So yes, I have to move this orchid around a lot based on the levels of light and how high the sun is in the sky. Apart from that, really, this orchid hasn't given me any, any issues. Every once in a while, I just pour a jug of water into her, whether it's fertilized or not. I am so happy I made this change. I'm really pleased with the setup and how the Akadama is working in my favor to not have to miss the base anymore, to not have to risk compromising any new growths down here. Just water goes in, pours out the holes, and my job is done for the next two or three days. So you can grow this orchid mounted if you can keep up with the watering. She makes a beautiful display on a mount and I enjoyed her on a mount as well. When the workload got too heavy, I had to change. I had to change things so that I could keep up because I don't want to miss out on these gorgeous, gorgeous blooms just because my leaves weren't opening cleanly. That's such a shame when you work so hard and you just can't keep up to make the orchid happy. I hope that you found this interesting, even though the setup is a bit unconventional. Maybe, maybe you have this orchid and you say, well, I can't keep watering it enough. I'm not around long enough to keep watering this orchid. Consider Akadama, consider a semi-hydro setup. You'll be surprised. <laughs> it's changed my life with this orchid and I have no more worries. Also, if you have this orchid and you post videos on social media platforms and would like to join in on future care collabs, please let me know in the comments below. We will be in touch and then I will add you to the list together with What's Up Orchids for future updates. Any questions that I did not cover when I'm talking about the care and culture of this orchid, again, please let me know in the comments below. I get very, very easily distracted when A, I look at blooms and I keep getting this waft of a fragrance up my nose. Honestly, that's where my head goes squirrel. And for that, I do apologize, but please take advantage of the comments below if you have any further questions. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch my video. What's up Orchid link will be in the description below. See what she has to say about hers. And let's see about the difference of the bloom color as well, because to my understanding, she does not have the alba form. And that color is what I was so taken by. Unfortunately, fortunately, at least I've got a healthy orchid. Mine is the albiform. At least this provides some diversity. Have yourselves a beautiful, beautiful day on one condition though. Please stay safe and take care. Bye. Mm -hmm.